we have Tom Logan, uh, and I am so excited to be able to talk with Tom. First, I'd like to welcome you to the Acting and Modeling Success Summit. And let me also just make sure that everybody knows that you are a true renaissance guy in the acting world. I mean, you've done pretty much everything in the industry from acting on TV shows, from films to theater, writing and directing. And before we actually talk about directing, there's something that I'm sure everybody's going to want to know about. You were a series regular on a number of soap operas like General Hospital, Days of Our Lives, Young and the Restless. And I am sure that people are really fascinated by this. And so I'd like to know what what is it like, you know, being a regular series on an episodic show? Well, a soap is, uh, of course, one of the toughest because they do about 100 to 120 pages a day, which is the equivalent of a play every single day. It'd be like you walk in the door me handing you a play five days a week, 52 weeks a year, and you're doing a play every single day. And, in fact, there's a bunch of holidays, and soaps are only shot a week in advance. So, uh, you know, about 10 or 12 days a year, they have to do two episodes in a day, which is 240 pages a day, which is the equivalent of me handing you two plays when you walk in the door and performing both of them. So doing a, a soap is a real grind, whereas doing a CSI Miami or a weekly a weekly show, a drama, you know, 50 to 60 pages, and a sitcom about 25 to 30 pages a week, whereas a soap can do anywhere from six to 700 pages a week. So you're talking a real difference between the different mediums, which is why soaps, of course, don't look quite as good or as polished, because literally they're doing in one day what a movie might do in a year or a year and a half. Now, I'm curious because normally, like, when I'm doing a film, I'm going to have, or a TV show, I have, like, a, normally at least a week uh, to, to memorize and prepare. Now, you were saying that they're typically shot a week ahead of time. So do you normally have seven days to memorize your lines? No. <laughs> if you get to, now, if you get the script a day or two before, that would be really good. I mean, I had some days I'd walk on and get it that morning, but you try to get it the night before, and if you get it the day before, you're doing really, really well. I mean, they're, they're only writing them a few days in advance, so and they're going to make some rewrites, of course, when you get there the next day. So it's real fluid. Uh, unlike a TV show where, like you were talking about, you might have a week or so to learn, you know, 30 pages or 35 pages. We're talking a day to learn 120. Now, everybody's not on all 120, but even to read 120 pages a day is a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so did you just, like, develop different kinds of memorization muscles to be able to just pick that stuff up and soak it in, you know, so quickly? Well, the thing that I would do, and I'm sure other actors would too, is, is it's such a long drive in L.A. to get to the studio because of traffic that I would record on a tape recorder the other person's lines and leave blanks for my lines. And so I could run lines with someone when, in fact, there was no one to actually run lines to. And that's pretty much how I did it. But I'm sure everybody has their own system. And, you know, in soaps, we'd have notepads in our hand and doctors have clipboards and, you know, they got script there. And we'd write them on the back of the set. I've written them on my hands. <laughs> now, now, nobody uses teleprompters anymore on soaps. I mean, I, I remember hearing that years ago, some of the stars, you know, would have prompters. Is that just not even heard of anymore? Well, I haven't been in that world in a while because I've been directing for the last 20 years. But I, I assume they still use, you know, the prompters are just a piece of glass, which is over the lens. It's not off to the side. And they can literally look, you know, right past the lens and read it. Or they have the kind that you hold and they will hold it behind someone's head. But uh, I would imagine they still have some kind of a prompter system. But think about you're talking to four or five people, 120 pages, you're moving and hitting marks. It's pretty hard to sit there and just read, you know, from a, from a prompter. So you can <laughs> glance at it, but that's about it. And, and did you have to be like word for word, or were they okay with, you well, know, pretty playing close. around? Pretty close because they're cutting from one camera to another on certain words and dialogue, and the boom man is moving on certain words, and the camera guy is moving on certain words. So, yeah, they expect it to be pretty close. <laughs> well, I've always found, um, and I've never had the opportunity to work on a soap, uh, but I've always thought that that would probably be one of the scariest mediums to work in just because it is so fast-paced and 
and you've just got to do so much in such a short amount of time and you don't have the luxury of lots of retakes and large establishing shots and things like that. There are no retakes. I mean, the set would have to fall down, hit you in the head, and they'd have to not be able to drag you off if you died <laughs> uh, for them to actually go back and reshoot something. It's pretty rare. Uh, again, think about a movie that's an hour and a half, and they spend five or six months at least shooting it. Forget the year or two they spent writing it, and the six to eight months to a year they spend editing it. This is all They do all that in one day. That is unbelievable. So how, what made you even think of making this transition? I mean, here you're a very successful actor. You've, you know, you've done tons of things, and then all of a sudden you decide to go into directing. What, what, well, what was actually, that all about? Actually, the acting to me was always a means to an end. I always really wanted to direct. And so the acting was just really learning what was going on behind the cameras. Uh, and then I wrote a script that Universal down in Orlando wanted to do, and but they didn't want me to direct it. And I said, then you can't have the script. And that went back and forth for about a year. And after about a year, this was in the 80s, and, um, you know, I, I could use the money. So I was about to sell it to them, and they happened to call one day and say, you know what, you can direct it. So that's that's how I got into the directing, and I never went through the whole thing where you go through the whole crew, which is what most people do to learn. But I'd been on sets for years and years, so I had a slight clue of what was going on. Well, you must have had uh, a, a, so much training just from on-set experience. I, I know as an actor, I mean, I, look, I still study with people periodically. I mean, I studied for many, many years, but I have to say that probably some of the greatest information that I ever learned about acting was being on a set and observing and asking questions and um, kind of eavesdropping on other, you know, other actors' conversations. And so I, I'm sure that... Well, you do. that yeah, you learn the lingo and all that kind of stuff, but when you start getting into lenses and focal points and uh, colors and how they do, and uh, that that that's something as an actor you really don't see that, you know, uh, I kind of had to learn on the spot. <laughs> so were you scared to death when all of a sudden you get handed this job and you've never done it before in your life? I, I wasn't scared. I'm an adventurous, but I did. I was married at the time, and I told my wife on the way we flew from L.A. down to Orlando where Universal was, and on the way down, I said, don't unpack for the first two months because they're going to figure out I don't know what I'm doing. So don't, <laughs> we, didn't, we didn't unpack. We lived in, a, in, our, in our hotel in a suitcase uh, for about two months. And I said, I think I'm secure here, so let's unpack. And, and I did five more pictures for him after that by a stroke of luck. That, well, you know, you're a very modest guy. I'm sure it was not a stroke of luck, but that's, that's incredible. Now, for, for other people who have an inclination to want to direct, what, what would you recommend them do? Well, one thing they could start doing that we really couldn't do when I was a kid because we just didn't have the technology is all the camera and editing equipment now that you can, you can buy pretty cheaply and all the editing stuff you can do with a computer that when I was a kid we couldn't do. They could start making little films. That's how a lot of people get started. Start trying to get on sets that whatever town they're in, if a movie is nearby or close as a production assistant, because it's, it's a long road. I mean, as a director, you pretty much have to know everybody's job on that set. You don't have to know it great, but you've got to know it enough to know if they're, if they're doing their job. That's what you have to know. Or if something happens, you could take it over and get through it. Again, I hire people who know much more than I do about each particular field. I just have to know enough to know if they're doing their job or doing it well. Now, I, I'm curious, and I know th this is could be a, you know, a very long kind of answer. You could spend a whole day doing a workshop on this, but may maybe in a condensed version, could you tell us the differences between when you were directing commercials or movies or TV shows? As opposed to, the, you mean the three? Uh, Don't lose three. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, you know, I know there's a, there's there are differences depending on the medium that you're working in, and I thought okay. maybe... Well, most people come from stage because that's where they get their first rehearsals. And the, uh, the extremes are stage and film because film is, you know, 30 or 40 times the actual size. If you had a pimple on your face and I shot a close-up of you, Aaron, and I put that close-up on the big screen, that pimple's now the size of about two six feet people standing on top of each other, and that's a 12-foot circumference, meaning that if a pimple goes from a little bitty dot to a 12-foot circumference, so, so does their acting. So those are the two extremes. And then in between, you have sitcoms, which is a little closer to stage. And then you have television, which is a little closer to film. 
And so you start off with the biggest, and, and, and you know, that would be stage, and then you move from that to sitcom, which is you play, of course, much less, but it's still a little broader. And then you move from that to television, uh, which is even less than sitcom, you know, regular television. And then you move from that to film, which is you're whispering the whole time and hardly ever moving your head. <laughs> now, kind of getting back to just specifically directing for TV, who exactly hires the director for a TV show? Well, it works a lot of different ways. Um, if it's a, let's start with film. A lot of times, I, you know, I produce a lot of the stuff I also direct. If you know some on my IMDb page, it'll have a lot of things I produce as, as well as directed and written on the same project. So in that case, I hire myself. But <laughs> in the case <laughs> have of, you ever uh, fired yourself by any chance? I'm sorry. Oh, no, have I you never ever have, fired? But I'm, th <laughs> I'm thinking about it. <laughs> Um, so what happens is a lot of times on a film project, I'll get a hold of a script I really like, or they'll come to me and say, we want you to do this script, and who would you like to produce it? So a lot of times I pick the producer. You know, people kind of have this idea that the producer's on, on charge on a set, and actually the director really runs a set. Um, yes, the people putting the money into it can call me over the side and say, what are you doing? What do you think you're doing here? Whatever. But really the director is in charge on a set. So the producers are, and there's a lot of different kinds of producers, of course. There's an executive producer, that's someone who gets the money, and then there's a producer, and that's someone who's kind of on set, making sure the director has what he needs, got all the film he needs, and ordering this and that and that kind of thing. And there's associate producers and assistant producers and segment producers and, and, and consulting producers and creative producers. I mean, you know, anyone who's on a set now pretty much has a producer title. So um, I'm generally hired by... Uh, a couple different people, either the money people, people who have money, and they have a project, and they come to me and say, we, we, we want you to do it. Every once in a while, a producer may hire me. Now, if it's a, a series, they have an ongoing show, and the director, unlike a film, is kind of a higher gun. I mean, he has control over that segment and that show, but it's a set show. The characters are pretty much set. Um, and so that's why I don't like to do it, and I don't do a lot of episodic for that reason because it's really kind of a formula type thing, whereas in a film, you know, you're, you're out looking for the locations. It's not the same locations like you'd have in a series from week to week to week. So just kind of a totally different ball game. Now, now I'm wondering, when, when it comes to auditioning for TV shows, generally, do you have callbacks or do you very rare? Now, I realize for the principals, I mean, that, that's a whole different thing. But, you know, for, for you know, day players, for, for weekly players, guest stars, do you generally will, uh, have callbacks after the initial audition? Absolutely. Yeah. I, I don't think I've ever done something on a first call unless... It was someone I had worked with kind of extensively before. Maybe they had a guest starring role or maybe they were starring in a film or, you know, something pretty big and I knew. And then I would still have them audition because I want to see how they're going to react and play off the other characters and how they're going to handle this character. Almost everybody auditions. Uh, I know people out there think stars don't, but, but really pretty much we read. There, there are very few people you don't read. Now, for after I was just wondering a little bit. Now, after that initial audition, you know, the casting director has everybody on tape. Will the casting director actually edit that audition day uh, and just give you, you know, her or his top five choices? Or do you want to see all the auditions and, you know, you make those decisions? I'm probably, well, I'll tell you what I do and then I'll tell you what most people do. I'm a little different than most people. I usually sit in on all the auditions. Even the first first round? I'm, yeah, yes, yes. Unless I'm in the middle of shooting something and can't, I sit in all auditions because I find that, a lot of times they may pass somebody up because they're not a good cold reader, but I can tell from what they're doing that they're really a good actor. They just may not be a good cold reader. Mm -hmm. So I, I think I can see past that. So I, I, I like them, but I've been wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but I sit, but not too often, but I sit in uh, most of the auditions. Most directors have the casting person. If, if it's television, if it's episodic, you see less because you're doing week to week. And, um, you know, they may... Um, narrow it down to 30 or 40, 50, you know, people or something. But for film, um, usually they, they may see a couple hundred people, three, four hundred people, something like that. I'll see more than that because I'm going to sit in on all of the auditions. And so for that callback, then if it's a television show, 
certainly the director is going to be there. The casting director is there. Would you also have the writers, potentially producers, uh, other people in that room as well? The only time you have the writers there, generally speaking, um, is if it's a sitcom and and a lot of sitcom producers are the writers. And they do that so they can control the product. A lot of, you know, sometimes you write something and um, it's changed so much you don't even recognize it by the time, you know, it, it airs. So in order to avoid that, a lot of writer, a lot of producers for sitcoms, uh, they actually started out as writers and still are. And you'll notice that a lot of times whoever produced the show wrote the show a lot of times. So in, in, in that case, the writer would be there because it would be one and the same. But other than that, it's extremely rare. I, I just really can't remember having the writer in unless the writer was one of the producers or I wanted their opinion on something, but generally not. Well, this is a question that I'm a little afraid to ask you, but um, <laughs> so after, let's say, let's say you're at a callback stage. And, you know, you're sitting there you know, with, you know, producer and casting director. The actor walks out of the room. What what do you guys talk about? You know, are you it, like sitting there? Well, I, let me just throw it out and ask you. Yeah, it, it's a million things. It could be something from someone in the room says, uh, gosh, I like her hair. I don't like her hair. She reminds me of my ex-wife. I can't stand her. I think she's kind of snobby, Tom. I didn't like her nose. Hey, she really she really read well. Gosh, I think she's perfect for this. You know, it, it runs the gambit. Um, you know, when you're seeing that many people, it's not like we have a lot of time in between people to do a lot of discussions. Mm-hmm. But the main, dis- but the discussion. Remember, this is television and film. It's not stage. So there are a lot of comments on whether they're physically right for this part. Doesn't mean they have to be physically beautiful necessary. I mean, something I said that caused some controversy out here once, and I was t- c- comparing the stage actors of New York to the actors in L.A., because um, looks aren't as important there. And I said, you know, and, and the thing about New York is actors really take their craft really, really, really serious. I mean, they work out in the theater. In L.A., they work out in a gym. <laughs> and, uh, you know, what I was trying to say was, basically, is that the – the physical doesn't mean they have to be, and when I say gym, I don't mean necessarily in great shape or anything. I just mean that this is a visual medium, unlike stage. We can't put a lot of shoe polish in your hair and make you look, you know, I guess we could. But basically, if we want someone 60, we'll get someone 60. We're not going to do like the high school play and put shoe polish in their hair and make them look 60. So the point is, is that not only does the acting have to be, you know, good, but so does the the visual to fit that character. Well, that I mean, that's why I tell people in, in my workshops, you know, really the most important aspect of the audition itself, it, it is your looks, because if you physically don't look right for the part, I don't care how great of an actor you are, unless you are a star, you're not going to get the job because you've got to be believable. Yeah, so, well, if, you know, if I've got a family, for instance, and I've got two parents that have bleached blonde hair and very light, light uh, skin... Uh, and then you bring in someone who has, you know, black hair and a different tone. It just doesn't look like, you know, uh, it just it has to match. It has to look like a family. It has to look like these two are brothers and sisters. They, mean they have to look exactly alike or whatever, but it has to visually be believable. If it's not visually believable, you are correct. The acting is not going to matter. Yeah. Now, I know there, there are different thoughts uh, about this, but... You know, if somebody were to ask you, they're just getting started, uh, they haven't really done much in the business, um, what would you say to them if they ask you, Sh- should I do extra work? It depends on where you are. Um, if you're in New York, you know, you're in that area, I assume it hasn't changed much. Uh, it used to be that it was fine, not too many people really cared because it's more of a theater town anyway, and, and a lot of actors would supplement their income that way. L.A. is really a television and film town. And they kind of have a saying out here, uh, which is really unfair, but it's once an extra, always an extra. Mm -hmm. Now, don't take that wrong. We need extras. They're very, very important. And to do it a few times to learn what goes on in a set is fine. But but the problem is, the reason they say once, always, is because it becomes comfortable. The money's pretty decent if it's a union shoot. And they start falling into that, and then they can't go on auditions because they're on sets all day doing extra work. And it kind of fulfills that need to be on a set and around it and all that. And they kind of get comfortable and just kind of stay there. 
And then there's a belief. Some people think, well, if I do extra work, I can move up and then do the speaking roles. Well, that's kind of like saying you want to be an airline pilot. Why don't you just become um, a flight attendant and then just move up? It just, you know, or, you know, I want to be a doctor, so what I'll do is I'll become a nurse and then move up. Well, I'm not saying nurses don't move up to doctors, but most people, most doctors spend their time studying that and nurses spend their time studying nursing. And yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I find I found that to be exact, exactly true. That in, in, especially in LA, if you are considered, you know, if you're doing extra work, you, that's what you're going to be considered, you know, yeah. an extra. Yeah. I, I do find on the East Coast it, it, it can be very different in, in the sense that there are a lot of people who will do extra work one day and they're getting booked for principal work, you know, uh, another yeah. day. But and remember, but it, I said that in New York, people do it all the time and it's fine. Uh, in other parts of the country, it's it's just there's not enough work to, uh, for most people to be able to just do principal roles all the time, and it's pretty accepted. But in L.A., the thought is, hey, there's a lot of work out here. Yeah, there's a lot of people trying to do it. But if but out here, you, if you have your choice between someone who had their own series last year or someone who's done 20 extra roles, uh, right. and both physically right for the part, who are you going to go with? And that's why it's also really important because sometimes people will also ask, well, should I put, you know, is it okay to put extra work on my resume? And and I'm, I'm going to have a whole discussion about resumes later, but just in general, I mean, you, you really shouldn't be doing that. It's just not saying anything about well, your people, acting skills. People try to fool us. They'll, they'll say they were in uh, Rocky, you know. Uh, well, we know that they filled a stadium full of people. I was in Two Minute Warning. Well, that was a whole football stadium full of people. <laughs> or they'll say uh, patron in bar. Or, we know that's an extra. I mean, it sounds better than extra to say you're a patron in the bar or whatever. Next, you know, but if you don't put a billing on there, like starring or co-starring or featuring or introducing our principal role, we're going to assume it's an extra because if, if anyone speaks, they're going to at least put principal role on there. And I assume that's also going to leave a bad impression because you're thinking, well, this person's trying to fool me. This isn't somebody I really want to work with. Well, they don't. You see know, it's not. It's not like. It, it, well, it's not like I look at it down on them or anything like that. It's just you, you kind of look at it for what it is. It's not real professional. Got it. If you want to do television and film, there's nothing wrong with doing extra work. I need extras badly. I, I'm not saying that, but I'm saying if you want to do speaking roles, fine. Do a few extra. Learn what's going on a set, but. Be careful that you don't stay there. Don't don't start trying to make a living at it. Because I, I can tell you, it was really interesting for me. I, I've done some stand-in work, and for people it's a who different. have, it, it's a little bit different. But the same concept of it's very easy to get sucked into having a steady job. You yeah. know, I, I knew where sure. I was going to be every day for the first time in my life. I worked a year and a half, and I knew where I was going to be. And you know, I'm not making a fortune, but you know, it was pretty decent money because I was the stand-in for every white male on this specific TV show. So I was on sets, you know, 12 hours a day. But yeah. what what does happen is not only do you lose your, your skills for auditioning and just doing acting work, but you also lose touch with any agent that you have been working with because you're out of commission during that time period. Totally so, available. Mm -hmm. yeah, so it, it was a great experience. And I still will do stand in work. If it if it comes up, but I'm not going to do long term standing work. You know, I'll do a couple of days if there's a project that's coming through town because you know they're always very interesting experiences for me, and I get a chance to meet people, and you're able to really watch some phenomenal actors up close, you know, and really learn from them. So uh, I think it can be a great experience. But yeah, I, I, I agree with you. You do have to be careful of not kind of falling into the trap of basically having a daytime job that's taking you away from what you really want to be doing. So just just to, to end things here, because I want to make sure that people know that along with everything else that you've done, uh, and I don't know if you've done heart replacement procedures and, and hip operations, but you've also written some best-selling books that people really need to know about. You've had four of them. Um, it's How to Act and Eat at the Same Time and Acting in the Million Dollar Minute. For people who would like to read the book, and you definitely should, uh, you can go to TomLogan.com. The website is right up on the slide here. And Tom, I, I just really, I want to thank you so much. I know how busy you are for taking the time, giving this incredible information to everyone. And uh, I look forward to seeing you sometime in the near future and maybe even getting a chance to work with you too. Well, I hope so, Aaron. You've always been a good friend, and uh, uh, I really appreciate your professionalism in the business also. And 
far as the books go, the, the, the last two you mentioned, uh, How to Act and Eat at the Same Time, the sequel, and, how, and, and Acting in the Million Dollar Minute, the sequel, would be the two that they would want to get because the first ones are, are older, the sequels are up to date and all of that. And they can get it at any, most, most bookstores, Barnes and Noble and those kind of things also, besides just uh, Amazon or Kindle or whatever, they can also get them at bookstores. Great. Well, Tom, thank you so much, and um, I hope to see you soon. Thank you, Aaron.